Welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and we are so excited to start another season of helping you grow plants the right way. This season gardening is really more important than ever. We will be here to answer your questions just as we've done for 68 years. Unfortunately, we won't be taking your calls for the foreseeable future, so you will need to send us pictures and emails for upcoming shows. That address is byf at unl.edu. Do not forget to tell us where you live. Attach those pictures as JPEGs. Also, don't forget to check us out on our social media network, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. You might also notice that we are observing social distancing with a limited panel. So let's take a few minutes to see what samples they brought in. We're kind of looking through our telescope here to see who's doing what. So Jody, what is, that looks like a food, like a carry out it's container. Out of just a bunch <laughs> of soil. So I actually brought termites. Ugh. Okay, ready? I'm gonna lift open the wood. So these are termites, and we don't normally see these guys because they are normally hidden. We think about subterranean termites, and we think about those winged swarmers, and those are the ones that are ready to mate. They come out in the spring or the fall after a rain, but these are the ones that are doing the damage. So this is a social colony of termites, and if you see this one with the red head, that one is a soldier, so they're in, that one's uh, specializes in defense of the colony. Uh, I was in the woods, you know, social distancing, and we looking for ticks actually, and we came across some termites. So I thought I would bring these in. A lot of times, people may be finding these in the garden under landscape timbers or old railway ties, or under planters. Unfortunately, sometimes they get into the home. The questions we usually get are what can they do to prevent this? And so you want to decrease conducive conditions. So you don't want to put you know, soil and wood together. So firewood close to the home or stacked right on the, on the ground and removing you know, things that you may be doing renovations with, keeping that out, outside, anything like that. You want to make sure there's some distance because these guys, you won't see them like this. They don't have eyes and they're really soft because they'll dry out. So they stay quite hidden. But if you see these by any chance, then you do want to call a professional. So subterranean termites. They're pretty creepy. <laughs> Thank you very much for putting those back where they belong in that box. <laughs> All right, Dennis. <laughs> you always have something that is interesting. Yes. So this is the time of year that raccoons, the female raccoon, is going to have her litter. And so she'll probably be tearing into your house. In the last two days, I've had three calls or emails uh, about raccoons trying to get into soffits. Um, if you're in an urbanized area or within three miles of an urbanized area, uh, pretty much your only defense is to trap the raccoon in a box trap. There are no repellents or sprays around. Can't get, doesn't hurt them at all. And they will not, you can't use any baits for them. So if you're in an urbanized area or a city or within three miles of it, your only defense is to box trap or live trap them. The way you do that is to use a box trap that's about, oh, 10 to eight inches square. And for bait, you will use, not cat food, because you get the neighborhood cat, not peanut butter, not anything else, but marshmallows. They, they love marshmallows. And you don't want to put them in the bait or any kind of bait in a cage that's on the bottom. You want to have it in the cage hanging from the top with a wire so the raccoon sees it in the cage and goes straight for it and doesn't try to put its paws in the side and knock it over. And the best thing to do is to put a burlap over the cage so it looks like a dark tunnel. The raccoon will go in and then, and then he's stuck in there. Once it's stuck in there, since they are dangerous and carry a lot of germs and viruses, call the authorities, animal control, humane society, to come and get the raccoon that's in the cage on your property. And Jeff, good luck following that. I know, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. 
All right, what do we have for beauty today? Well, after our 60 degree morning and 30 degree evening, um, I thought I'd look for something that was blooming. And right now the Cornelian cherry dogwood is just finishing up uh, a few weeks earlier than we typically expected. I think actually one of the last shows I was on last August, I was bringing in fruit from the Cornelian cherry, mm -hmm. so it's kind of whatever uh, symbolic that I brought ending and beginning of the same plant. So anyway, so they're flowering. They've had a they've had a good stint here this spring. They've done really well at flowering. Then the other plant here is a threadleaf cypress. So the um, cypress plants now are a little bit more common around here than we used to see them. Mm -hmm. And they come in a lot of different colors. This one has a, kind of a gold tip uh, needles on it, but um, I have two or three in my yard that are kind of different shapes and forms, so they're fun. They're very hardy. They seem to do really well. So. That's interesting because they didn't used to. No. But here we go with the change in. Yeah, habit. right. Yeah. So a few degrees warmer, and now all of a sudden they're doing just fine. So yeah. excellent. That's a nice combination. Thank you, Jeff. All right, Jody. First uh, question, first picture of the year. This is an Omaha viewer, and she says she has these little beetles in our house. What kind are they? They're usually on the curtains or the walls, and they can fly. Okay, if you've got a few of them, you may have some dermestid beetles here. So they're called dermestid beetles, because that's the group of beetles. A lot of times people know carpet beetles. Um, they're known for natural, I guess, plant or animal products, and so, if you've got a bunch of these flying around, so these are the adult beetles. They're going towards light and they're, you're seeing them. There are larvae somewhere. So what you're gonna do is try to find the source. So the source may be a bird's nest. It may be dry dog food or pet food. It could be like wool fibers. It could be food in the pantry. And the food doesn't necessarily have to be open. They could be in you know, packages that have not opened yet, but you do want to go through that and find the larvae. So the larvae look like little worms that are, have very sharp, bristly hairs. And if you do consume those by accident, they can cause an allergic reaction. So it's something that you would wanna throw that food out if you find it, but there's no insecticide recommended. It's really finding the source, um, isolating it and getting rid of it. So try to find out where the larvae are and that's going to be the source you may, um, just want to vacuum up the adults though. I'll be looking forward to beauty in bugs instead <laughs> yeah, of creepiness. <laughs> All right, uh, Dennis, um, this is a viewer who wants to know what is making holes in the flower garden. They appear to tunnel, whatever it is has damaged all sorts of things. They're tunneling between the stones on the path. They've moved the limestone edging. She was hoping we'd save holes and not rats. Well, we will say voles. Good. <laughs> and, you know, so voles, you know, of course, look like this. I always kept a vole with me in my pocket. And short tail, and they love to leave little paths. And there's a granivore, so if there's any seeds from the garden, that's what they're after. The best way to get rid of them is to use a repeating trap with a little grass seed to, to bring them in. And these traps will hold up to 15 of them. And these are the box traps that repeat. And they go in there and it flips them into a chamber. All right, excellent, or not. Okay, Jeff, uh, this is one of the things you, that you do really well among oh. others. This is a viewer who has uh, one of the hydrangeas, the newer Incredible, okay. so the big ones. Um, they're in Papillion, they wonder how and when to prune this for the best health of the plant and, and the flowers. Okay, all right. Well, and this particular variety is noted by its stiffer stem, so it holds the flowers up a little bit longer, which is nice, because the Annabelle will tend to flop sometimes in certain years, especially water years. Well, this is the right time to prune it. Um, we want to leave about a third of the stem, so you can kind of look at the height of them and, and judge that yourself. Um, so you don't want to take them clear to the ground. Again, leave maybe a foot, 18 inches, something like that. I notice they're in rock. And so, especially with uh, hydrangeas, uh, I think I'd pull the rock back and put eight to 10 inches of mulch around the outside, so in width, not in depth. You know, a couple inches depth, but eight, eight to 10 inches away from the crown of the plant. That would also kind of help you with, uh, with the hydrangeas as well. All right, excellent, thanks, Jeff. 
Well, with everything that's happening in our communities across Nebraska and in, around the world, we are so thankful that we can continue our program. Gardening is one of those skills that will help you cope with some of the problems we're facing by growing your own food and getting outdoors for some fresh air. So let's take a few minutes to greet you properly and thank you for joining us this year. we start our season with great enthusiasm. In spite of blizzards one year, perhaps a flood another year, a strange insect or an invasive weed, we give you on Backyard Farmer all that great science-based information in a fun and informative way that lets you enjoy the gardening world. uncertainty in the world right now, it's easy for us to forget that some things are absolutely certain. And one of those, of course, is here comes spring. The sun will shine, the grass will grow, some of our buds are already breaking, and if only you could smell what I have in my hand, you would understand that one of the things we need to do when we need it the most is go outside and play. going to go outside and play you have to have something to play with in your garden and of course this is the preparation for the backyard farmer garden these are plants grown by the horticulture club the garden centers are going to have plants and seeds and that great opportunity for you to engage with your family and your friends in the garden in the great outdoors So every single Thursday night, we show up like clockwork at NET Studio to bring you all that great information, just like we've been doing for the last 68 years. Welcome to Backyard Farmer. Welcome back indeed. We can't wait to hear from you. Emails, please, and answer your questions this year. We will not be having a phone panel. Social distance is a little tricky with uh, six people answering the phones in a tiny little room. So email those questions and pictures to us. All right, Jody, your next picture question. And you had lots of calls about this. So um, this particular person is saying, these are infesting my spruce. Knew it. and heard they might leave eggs behind. Uh, what damage do they cause and how do we get rid of them? Okay, so these are bagworms. It's probably one of the top five things I get called about every year. And last year was a really bad year for bagworms and you'll see them hanging on everything. Signs, fences, brick walls. <laughs> um, they are caterpillars that turn into moths, some of them. But the damage they will do is of the evergreen trees, they can kill your tree over many years um, of infestation. They just defoliate. And because those trees don't shed their leaves and they need those leaves for energy, uh, it, it will be bad. So, but we did see bagworms feeding on like vegetables and deciduous trees last year. Those should be okay because the leaves fall off and they um, will come back. But right now is the time to take them down. So you can pull them off if you can reach them. They're tied on really tight with silk. So you may want to use a scissors or a shear, but you want to get rid of those um, before the end of May. The little caterpillars, probably hundreds of them, will emerge early June. And so if you are going to miss some of them and you can't get them all, so right now they're not moving. That's why it's the best time to take them down. Otherwise, Little tiny caterpillars will hatch out and that's the time to treat. If you can use something like um, BT, BTK, that's going to um, be effective, but you've got to treat you know, the tree completely because it's the caterpillars feeding on that, that treated surface. But um, 
when I tell you <laughs> that they're out, that's when you should treat. But most people don't believe me because they are so, 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 so tiny. And they also think that right now, because they see the bag. Right. So the bag, yeah. yeah, so the caterpillar is, well, so 50% of those are male, theoretically, right? So some of them already came out as a moth in October, but we can't tell that sometimes. And the other ones are the female bags, and so they will be filled with eggs, like probably 300 to 500 in there. Mm. So the, yeah, so there's, there's a lot that may be coming. We have them all over the trees in our yes. courtyard. And you can't reach surrounded those ones, no. they're way no, high. Surrounded by a building, and here they are all over. It's like, seriously, terrible. Yeah. <laughs> all right, thanks, Jody. Okay, so uh, this is an Arlington, Nebraska viewer. You okay. have two different pictures from two different viewers here, but this first one is Arlington, Nebraska. Uh, she found two holes under a maple tree in the backyard. She thought it was an insect. They're about an inch across. She wondered, is it burrowing in or burrowing out this time of year and, and sh they were pretty close together. So what do you think? It's an insect, it's not a vertebrate pest. Uh, Inch in diameter? Yeah. In February. Yeah, well in February? Yeah. It happened in February? Yeah, late February. It might March be an earth, well. Is it cricket? It could be a cricket. Um, it does not look like a vertebrate pest. Really? No. Okay. Not how chunky the ground is and everything. What do you think, Jody? I don't know what kind of insect yeah, in that February. would be because it's early in the season and they'd have to be pretty hardy or large to right. take that out. Uh, squirrel? No, it's definitely not squirrel. I looked at it. <laughs> so she needs a trail cam to yeah. see if it's still there. <laughs> yeah, or put some talc powder around it. I, I'm, it's either a big earthworm or a spider. There's spiders that are, merge out like that. And yeah. I would think they, that if it was a spider, it would have more shelter, like more yeah. landscape. It just doesn't look like a, any any vertebrate animal. I, no, it's a new we are discovered <laughs> animal for Dennis. Well, it's not new. It's just, <laughs> we I just can tell you what it's not. I just don't. <laughs> All right, you have another picture, and maybe you'll know what this one is, right? <laughs> I, I know you'll know this one. This is at Council Bluffs. You are a very good one. She lives in the Lost Hills. She's found, she's, this is near their blackberry beds. She's found a few and she's never seen this in Council Bluffs before. Well, it's a foal and they're all <laughs> over Iowa and Council Bluffs. Yeah. Um, I can tell there was snow here at one time. Yeah. And really all you need to do is rake this and the grass will come back once it starts growing. But it's just the voles um, just going through underneath the snow subvenially eating all any kind of seed. Maybe it's the first time there's been a lot of seed in that area or their population has just grown and their populations grow very rapidly and then crash. So, all right. these guys. So we have, uh, for Jeff, I think we also have spruce trees as your first question. Both okay. trees started out the same way. The branches died first, then they progressed up the tree. The tree is brown. He says um, that there was, there were old corn cribs mm -hmm. there, and he's wondering about soil contamination. They've been gone for three to four years, but the second set of trees in the same spot has died. Right. So what do we? So I think recommend? theoretically, I mean, you're right. There could have been if there was some, some product they were using around the corn cribs heavily, um, then there could be some residual of that in the soil. So I think that's certainly part of it. You know, that really looks like winter burn. Mm -hmm. And, you know, looking at the trees, they're not mulched. Uh, they're in an open area, so they're, you know, terribly exposed. Um, so if you weren't watering them through the winter, and that, that would be a, a place I would be watering, especially if it's kind of compacted soil anyway because of the old corn crib being there. Um, so I think there's probably multiple things that I would be looking at. So if you're looking at replacing in that area, um, I would maybe think of using some deciduous trees and then doing some excavating, taking some of that old soil out, bringing in some new soil, some topsoil, composted, mixed, uh, putting that in there, and then making sure that you are checking those new trees throughout the winter for maybe, you know, five years. If we have a dry winter, if there's not a lot of snow cover, then we're out watering trees. All right, so really starting with this, the issue with the soil potentially in yeah. a way. Yeah. yeah, at least eliminating that as right. a concern. Okay, thank you, Jeff. You know, we are busy getting everything ready for this year's Backyard Farmer Garden. 
Extension educator Terry James is back to give us those weekly updates we have really grown to love. So let's take a minute to visit the Backyard Farmer Garden. We're excited to start the new season for Backyard Farmer Garden and we're going to check out what we've been growing. As you can see in the greenhouse, we have everything started. Everything is green and lush. We've had some really good sunny days to help keep those plants going up and not stretching very much. Had to water a little bit extra because of those sunny days and the warm in the greenhouse, but that's okay. We don't mind spending a little bit of extra time in the greenhouse this time of year. We have some new All America Selection stuff. We got some new blender plants that we're going to be able to try to kind of blend some of those colors together. We're gonna to be able to see lots of cool things in the raised beds, in the ground beds, and in the containers. We're gonna have lots of things to show you this year, so make sure that you're spending some time watching the Backyard Farmer Garden Minute. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. We're very excited yeah. to be on our way this year and we really cannot wait to see how our garden grows. So if you're out taking a walk, we'd love to have you visit the garden here on East Campus at that social distance. So we had a little conversation real quickly, Dennis, about what those holes might have yeah. been. <laughs> One thing that came to mind is prairie crayfish and then Jody also said possibly Bumblebee Bumble queens? Mm -hmm. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, Bumblebee queen. It, I think it's more likely one of those two things. Okay. Yeah, like if it's something coming out of the ground, because Bumblebee queens overwinter right. somewhere. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Find out. Yeah. I like the Bumblebee queen. Also, like, you know, if they're in <laughs> hydric soil, it could be a prairie crayfish. Yeah. I like the trail cam idea or the <laughs> talc powder. Yeah, but yeah, the talc powder. But if it's emergent hole, yeah. They're not going to come back. Yeah, they're, That's they're out. They're out and gone. Yep. All right. Thanks. All right, uh, Jody. Just a question here. Okay. Um, this is a viewer who 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 brought in um, plants for the winter, and then she's discovering all sorts of like small little webbing and white sort of insect things in those leaves. What are some of the insect pests that we have on house uh, plants? Well, it could be many of the different sap sucking insects like white flies are a problem on, is it hydrangea? Mm -hmm. hydrangea? White flies can be a problem and they will um, leave it all sticky. So what you can do, um, if it's still inside, you can you know, prune off anything that you can and then you can also use insecticidal soap and uh, spray that on the leaves and make sure to spray on the underside. So just take a closer look and see if there's any of that sap and then you could um, hopefully you know, save your hydrangea. All right, thanks, Jody. Okay, Dennis, um, this is a viewer who says something dug a hole in the backyard about three inches in diameter. Okay. Goes underground at least five inches. He, f he did discover it was a mole, so he must not have gone deep enough. But another viewer was then wondering if they do have moles, which they think they do, can you use a repellent or a killer or something now and how to do that? Um, the repellents don't work very well. There is one that we have in our NEB guide using castor oil that is only about 17% effective. The best way to go is to wait till it gets a little bit more uh, warmer and go with um, the gummy worm type uh, apparatus or you can go with the mole harpoon traps or choker traps. And we have an excellent NEB guide if you go to wildlife.unl.edu and it'll tell you about all these methods to get the mole. And it's a perfect time to get them. They love earthworms and earthworms are very prevalent right now. All right, excellent, thank you. Dennis, Jeff, this is a Murray, Nebraska viewer, wants to know is it too early to till the soil for the garden and she's worried about disturbing things, so maybe it's the good creatures that she's oh. not wanting to disturb. Well, part of till. tilling is disturbing things, <laughs> so I'm gonna have to get past that. Um, you know, the, my issue right now with tilling is how wet it is. So if your soil is really wet, then I would hold off um, and just wait till things dry out a little bit. But you don't wanna go into really mucky soil and be tilling. So you may have to get in there with your garden fork and just check a little bit. I was doing that this weekend just to see how wet my garden was and it wasn't ready yet, so. Okay, excellent, mine wasn't either. It's pretty wet still. Yeah. All right, thank you, thank Jeff. for that, but right now it's time for our very first lightning round for this year. 
Are you ready, Jeff? I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Yes and no answers this time. Yeah, no. So. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Some of them are. All right. The very first one is from a viewer who says, should I cover my peas and my radishes tonight since it is supposed to snow? I would, yes. Okay. Right. That was yes. simple. Okay. What about perennials? This is a different viewer. What about perennials? You know, I think most of them will be fine, but if you're worried about it, it doesn't hurt to put a tarp or something over for one night. It's supposed to warm up right away, so I would say go for it. But don't use plastic. I wouldn't use plastic, though. No. All right. This viewer um, in Papillion had a maple and started cutting the branch mm -hmm. and then wasn't sure she should, so she stopped cutting the branch. Should she go ahead and cut the branch? If, she start, if you start to cut the branch, finish cutting the branch, and then just kind of deal with uh, ramifications later. All right. <laughs> So why are maples actually bleeding now, and is it too late to prune them? I don't know if it's too late to prune them, but yeah, they'll, they're running their sap right now, so they're getting ready to emerge and push out new leaves, and all that moisture they're pulling up to, to feed that new growth. So it, it, all trees do it. It just is a little bit more noticeable with maples. All right, nice job. They were not... Yes, no question. I know, I know. You can't help myself. <laughs> All right, Dennis, are you ready? Always ready. Okay, we have a viewer who had great pictures of an eagle nesting near Utica. Is this unusual? Not anymore, they're coming back. Uh, it's one of the success stories. We about killed them off, but we changed our ways and they're making a comeback. And they're all across the state, especially this time of year. All right, we have a viewer in Nebraska City who says the squirrels are digging about three inches apart <coughs> in loose soil. They're just Digging. What what are they doing? They're trying to find their nuts. Uh, they they bury them and they just don't. Sometimes they don't know exactly where they're at and they have to try and try. All right. Um, this this particular viewer actually bought a multi catch mouse trap at a store in Hastings and the trap said release the mice after catching them, like have a heart kind of a thing. Is that a good idea? Well, it's, it's up to you. If you want to feed the bull snakes and the hawks, yeah. All right. Um, you know, it, that's completely up to you. You can release it because the multi-catch traps, like I was talking about for the voles, they will uh, keep alive. Okay, excellent. Nice job. Good also, answers, Dennis. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> long answer. I like, I like them, though. They're good. They mean something. They're meaningful. Yeah, it's a really slow heat lightning <laughs> storm <tonight. laughs> Okay, Jody. You ready? It's going to be easy yeah. to win. Well, I don't yeah. know. Okay. So will wasps who built a nest on the house return to that nest? Uh, the paper wasps do not, but it won't stop paper wasps from building over top of those nests. So right. knock them down now. Do termites live in mulch? This is a South Sioux City viewer. Um, they can live under the mulch. Okay. <laughs> it's not, well, I mean, I, the mulch. <laughs> yes or no? It depends. <laughs> is it old mulch? See, now I'm going to lose. <laughs> okay. Uh, how do you They don't kill... come in the mulch. <laughs> the mulch tap. This is a Fairberry viewer who has little tiny ants in the house. What are they and what will kill them? Okay. De it, it, it depends. If they're in the kitchen, they're probably pavement ants. If they're on the first floor and they're coming up under the slab, um, I would use something like sugar bait. There's a lot of different active ingredients that you can get. You just have to make sure you put them in the right places, not on the counter, closest to the outside where they're coming in. All right. Uh, when can we expect uh, praying mantises to come out of their egg cases? This is Nebraska City. Um, it's probably going to be middle of June. Middle of June. <laughs> nice answer. Good it's job. a tie. Yeah. <laughs> that maybe have... question is like an email this long. <laughs> Yeah, but for lightning, you could just say yes, no, and call it good. All right, that was fun. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. Good answers. That was nice job. Okay. okay. There's no yes, no answers. Yeah. No, I can't or do passes, it properly. Or passes. It doesn't yeah. warn pass. We need to retrain you for the year, right? Yes, no, or maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Or it depends. I shape. like this group. I want to we're be just too, we're just too laid back. <laughs> we're out of shape. We want to, get, we want to inform. You know? That's right. That's that the, works. We're used to doing all this remote teaching, so we, that's why yeah. we're... Yeah. We're teaching. Okay, Jeff, what are we teaching about with our plants of the week? Well, we, you brought two fun plants here. So we have Nanking cherry, which is uh, a prunus. It puts on an edible uh, little red cherry. 
They're delicious. Uh, we were talking about how they can be kind of short-lived. You know, you might get 10 good years out of them, but some may be longer just depending on where they're at. But, you know, anyway, so it's a, it's a lovely plant. It gets, I don't know, maybe like 10 feet tall. Um, but it's, it's a nice plant to have and good if you have kids in the yard and they want to eat something, then they can, they can eat that and you don't have to worry about it. They spit out the pits. <laughs> And then you brought some Scylla that's been emerging here. It's probably gonna be covered with a little bit of ice and snow in the morning, but uh, so that's a fun plant. And it also naturalizes really well. So it's a, it can be a fun plant to have if you, if you want a, a uh, non-lawn lawn, so rock wouldn't like it, but uh, for those of us that like uh, herbaceous plants and bulbs and that sort of thing, this would be a fun plant to have. Right, and it is that color of blue, which is the uh, plant of the year, so blue. Yeah. yeah, and then it goes dormant, so he can have his lawn and then he can, can have, have his lawn later. Yeah. yeah, exactly. All right, so we have pictures next. Uh, let's see here. You have Jody. Um, this is Pines. This is Crescent, Iowa. She had this one trimmed last fall, and then she looked out at this spring, and there's the big picture, and then she thought, well, is this woodpecker holes or nematode? She did call somebody to look at it, and he said it's pine wilt. So you want to talk about pine wilt a okay. little bit and well, sap suckers instead of yeah. borer holes? <laughs> so, so pine wilt is caused by, an, it's, a, it's a fatal disease to the pine tree that's caused by a nematode that's passed along from a, the pine sawyer beetle. And then when they're in there and other bugs and sap too, then a sap sucker, which is a type of woodpecker? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a bird, it's an avian. A bird yeah. that mm -hmm. makes these holes in those, those lines that right. go in a row, um, trying to find sap and can they find insects too? I mean, it, Actually, that one, it looks more like a flicker holes, and they're right. after the insect. They're after the insect, so it's a circle of life going on in there. Yep. But that tree doesn't look good, but I'm not a tree person. Is that, can that happen that fast, Jeff? Well, you know, the, the, the beetle has been in there for a while, so okay. it's probably taken a few years. But usually, once things start warming up in the spring, that's when we really notice, uh, notice that. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of times in the fall, you know, if you're watching your trees, they, they're still green, but they're just all of a sudden a duller green. And that's, off. Yeah, they're off a little bit. Yeah. And that's, to me, a sign that we're probably going to lose that tree to pine wilt. Yeah. yeah. And if it's pine wilt, like, cut it down. Cut it down. Bury it, mulch it up, fire yeah, it. Yeah, I would have it. Right away, right? Yeah, I would cut it down and then have it ground into mulch. Yeah. If you have a place you can take your, your wood, then have them grind it. Because it can still pass to other right. healthy trees. So right. you definitely want to take care of that. So unfortunately, that's a former tree based on yeah. insects, diseases, pests, yeah. everything. Not everything. Those insects, the, larvae have, the, birds. the larvae have to be pretty good size for the flickers to go after them. Yeah, it's a yeah. pretty big. So, the, so you're, they're well along by the time the bird goes after them. Yeah, it's fun to watch those holes drilled. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Dennis, uh, this is an Elkhorn viewer that has an Ammer maple that she says the deer got. Oh, yeah. And first she's wondering, can it repair itself or should it be pruned off? But the question for you is, it, should we expect that deer to come back and do this year after year like squirrels mark their territory? Um, well, actually there's a rub of a deer and it may or may not come back. Uh, it's probably a younger uh, buck. There's a good chance it would. I would protect it next season from the deer. As far as the branch dying, it looks like it's pretty well around there, so yeah. I, uh, Jeff, you would say it's I'd say go trim ahead. it off. Yep, remove it. Yeah, I would put a cage around that next season to stop, For sure. to stop other deer from coming in. Or the fence on, they see in the background, if that's around the whole yard, that'd be, that's a pretty good fence to stop deer. Yeah, all right, so you have another one, and this is actually a Nanking cherry. This is near Firth. It's it's not on the ground, but it's you know pretty close to the ground yeah. branch. This is squirrel damage, they yep. think, and why? And if they prune that off, do they just keep doing the same thing to a different branch? Well, it, they may do the same thing. That's a squirrel chewing, and it looks like it was done a year previously because it looks like the squirrels are after the the wound area, and they're after the the starch and the sugar. Um, and they usually do that in the winter. 
So they would probably come back. That, those squirrels would probably come back to the same area and, and just feed, feed again. They like the Nanking cherry, they just don't want the fruit. Right, oh they would probably want the fruit too, but this time, <laughs> the time of year in the winter, there's no fruit, so they're going for the, so to speak, the sap or the starch. All right. Okay, so um, Jeff, this is from Holt County, and they have been underwater, a lot of water, and of course that right. part of the state has gotten more moisture anyway. She says she has a weeping willow planted two years ago, a maple and an elm, the smaller ones. The elm hasn't been underwater for the majority of the time. The weeping willow has been pretty much sitting in water for the entire year. The maple isn't typically surrounded, but the roots have been extremely wet. She's wondering whether she should think about replacements for these trees. You know, in all honesty, if I was gonna pick three trees to sit next to a pond, those might be the three I would pick. Mm -hmm. So they will tolerate, um, tolerate the, the saturated soils for a long period of time. Um, and I guess at this stage, I would like to just see how they, they work come springtime if they leaf out. You know, in theory, you would plant weeping willows in an area like this to draw down the moisture uh, because they are a heavy water user. Mm -hmm. So if anything, you know, if the weeping willow does well, I would be interested in getting a couple more to put in there to see if I could draw the water table down a little bit because I think that's what we're dealing with here is high water table. So, as much as anything else, yeah. yeah, the flooding and everything else. But the maple, you know, um, they should handle it. And a lot of elms, a lot of uh, American elms, I'm guessing that's probably a Siberian, but American elms can handle wet areas as well. So, okay, so, excellent. Cross your fingers. She'll be happy to hear that. Your second one is actually a question about what to do. This is a Lincoln viewer. Mm -hmm. Um, they want to reduce the, the width of that particular planting bed, but they'd like a hedge of some sort in there. Any right. suggestions? Well, and they, this is also a, kind of a wet area sort of thing too. Uh, I think they have storm water that goes down this. Mm -hmm. You know, my first thought is helping to try to divert the storm water a little bit to see if you can minimize that. You want to, re, you want to bring that um, mulch in and make it a little bit more narrow. And if you're going to look at some plants that would do well in there, um, there are some newer versions of some dogwoods, red stem dogwoods out there that are good. Chokeberry will handle some moisture. Uh, Euonymus. Um, you could look at, if you have a lower area, you could look at some things like the flags, so the irises. Um, you could do something like that. The Backyard Farmer Garden has lots of options there for mm -hmm. kind of rain garden sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So certainly at the low end of that, if you want to capture some of that water, that would be something you could do, come here to get some inspiration for some of the plants that you use here on campus, so. Excellent, good ideas for her. Thank you, Jeff. You know, for most of the time that Backyard Farmer has been on the air, one of our most frequently asked questions for the first couple of shows has been about the timing of pre-emergence for our turf grass. So here to help sort out that question, we have Extension Turf Grass Specialist, Rock Gaswa. One of the rights of spring is determining when you put down your pre-emergent herbicide to prevent crabgrass and other annual grassy weeds. It's one of our most asked questions, and I'm pleased today to be able to talk to you a little bit about how to maximize the efficiency of that herbicide application. There are a number of ways you can do that. A commonly accepted way for years was the use of plant phenology of ornamentals. For example, when forsythia blooms, that's often when people say, okay, it's time to get your pre-emergent herbicide down. Data as well as scientific research shows that that's often not going to be right. More frequently than not, it'll be an application too early, which will result in not season long control. So I'm not a big fan of plant phenology. Some of you are, and some of the lawn care companies go abide by that rule. But the reality of it is, is that's questionable based on the number of different plants out there, number of different varieties. So no, I would not say that plant phenology is the way to go. Some people go by ambient temperature. In Nebraska, we've had ambient temperatures up into the 70s and low 80s as early as February. So if you start using ambient temperature, that's a little more problematic as well because soil temperatures are much more buff buffered, they don't increase at the same rate, and they don't react to a sunny, bright, high temperature day like, like the ambient air does. So no, ambient temperature doesn't really work that effectively. Finally, there is soil temperature. And there are a number of ways to get soil temperature. One of the primary ways is simply using a small handheld thermometer and sticking it at the ground at a two inch depth. There are a number of different 
thermometer is out there. As a matter of fact, you may have one in your drawer that you use for testing meat in the smoker or on the barbecue grill that may work perfectly for you. They have uh, analog ones, which are obviously okay, but the trouble is, is they don't really have the precision that you would like. The digital ones are far better. They're easy to read, they turn on and off, and if you replace batteries, they're gonna work almost indefinitely. So we prefer the digital type thermometers for measuring soil temperature. Finally, there's ways to get soil temperature online. You look at the website down at the bottom of this and it'll take your soil temps across the state of Nebraska. And for those of you in neighboring states, you can use the closest weather station to get that number. And it'll record soil temperatures. One of the shortcomings, however, of that soil temperature online information is it's at four inches. We prefer for crabgrass germination, you use a two inch temperature probe. Um, depth of your temperature probe so that you can maximize the opportunity to accurately predict when the crabgrass is going to germinate. Crabgrass germinates as well as goosegrass and foxtail and others when soil temperatures get to about the 60 to 70 degree Fahrenheit. We want the pre-emergent herbicide to go down before that. So our magic number is three to four days in sequence with an average soil temperature of 55 degrees and you're good to go. So use that soil temperature to maximize the efficiency of your pre-emergent application and you'll be a lot happier late summer when the crabgrass usually gets away from you. So with a little warmer temp out there, either keep a close eye on those online reports or as Rock said, grab a thermometer, measure it yourself. We set a record in Lincoln at 78 degrees yesterday. So I don't know what it is doing on campus, Jeff, but my guess is... It's starting. It's yeah. starting. Yeah, we'll probably start our applications this week here. Here we go. Yeah. yeah. After the snow. After the <laughs> after it cools things off a little. <laughs> okay. Uh, your next couple of pictures, Jody, are an East Lincoln viewer, had magnolia scale last year terribly, and I know we had it on campus mm -hmm. too. Uh, wondering about the treatment, what and when. Okay, so that's what it looks like when you pull one of those big soft scales off. Um, the treatment, well if she missed it in August, it would probably be right now mm -hmm. um, because those crawlers, those little gray ovals that were close by there, those are crawlers that have overwintered like that. So um, is it dormant oil would be best. In other places that are not as warm or do, there's no like bud swelling, um, it would be a good time to, to treat. Right, Jeff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so dormant oil. And we did have a lot of magnolia scale in Lincoln. So. Yeah, we did. So the time is right. The time is now. Okay. All right. And your next one is also a scale picture. This is in Omaha. Uh, there, And this was came in just this week. So treatment for this okay, now. So, um, this is a different kind of scale. So this is a hard scale. This is euonymus scale. And, okay, so these ones have more generations per year. So when they're crawlers, and that's when it's gonna be the effective time to treat, and it'll be a horticultural oil. It will be like late May, and then you're gonna to wanna to treat again every six weeks because there's more generations, unlike the magnolia scale, which is like one per year. All right, excellent, thanks, Jody. Okay, this is pretty fun, uh, Dennis. This is actually, um, Grand Rapids, Michigan, and you know, using the yard to teach things for yeah. kids that are not in school, and they found this skeleton, and they wonder what it is. It's avian. Uh, whether it was a chicken trying to cross the road, or a, <laughs> <laughs> or a hawk that got hit, but it's definitely a bird. Um, so it's a bird skeleton. I can easily see that by the hips. Yep, <laughs> that's definitely bird hips. Either that or dinosaur hips, and now. That's bird hips. Okay. So. Yep, it's a guess. bird. <laughs> <laughs> you just amaze me with your skill set. You can identify an animal by its hips. Yeah, well, bird <laughs> hips are so unique. Yeah. They're nothing like reptile hips uh, yeah. or mammal hips. <laughs> and rose, hips. Really <laughs> rose hips. Rose hips. Hips don't lie. Yeah. <laughs> rose hips, hips don't, don't lie. lie. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, Jeff, uh, this is actually a, an identification question from Partridge, Kansas. Mm. Found this growing in their yard and wondered what this might be. And I, I know we have this on campus, too. Yeah. 
I would say this is Surprise Lily. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they do move a little bit. You'll see them pop up from time to time as a surprise. Mm -hmm. And it's probably been there. It's obviously been there for a while and it's now right. just really getting to a, a good size. So you should have fun pink flowers here in, in a August. few months. So, yeah. yeah. So that'll go dormant though, so they need to mark it, right? Is right. that what yeah. you would recommend? Yeah, and, the, and those should stay green here for quite some time. And you're right, as we get into the heat of the summer, those leaves will fade away, kind of like a lot of our bulbs do. And then you're right, surprise in August, we'll have some flowers, so. Yep, excellent, fun. fun. Okay, and then you have another one that is, um, this is a picture from last summer. He lives in Papillion. He absolutely loved it. it. It was a weed that planted itself, but he loved it because it was absolutely filled with butterflies. He wonders what it is and whether it is a weed. Well, it, it, we talked about this, so it's definitely a mint, and um, you thought maybe wild whorehound. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's something like that. It's going to be a catnip or a whorehound, but it's a, a mint. And so the, the, probably the problem with this is, is that it may be a bit invasive over time. So it, it volunteered itself, and with all those flowers, it's producing a lot of seed. And I'm sure it is fun to have. So if you like it, you may have more. Uh, or your neighbors may end up with some in their perennial bed that they might not be happy <laughs> so, about. So, so happy about. Everybody will have it. All right, excellent. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Well, of course, we always uh, provide announcements of things that are going on in the gardening world. Not much else going on in other places right now. So uh, I think we simply have one announcement tonight, and that is that any tea building is closed, so please don't mail or deliver samples. There's nobody here to get them and no way to get them. Same thing for us in our building. We will also announce when we are able to resume receiving those physical samples on Backyard Farmers. So make sure you send us those emails, attach those pictures as JPEGs. We're happy to answer anything we can. We just can't bring stuff in for uh, social distancing.